Hey guys, welcome to Unleash Podcast brought to you by Hidden Gen, where we talk about how to unleash your hidden potential. I'm your host, Yuri the Origins, and we have a great episode for you today featuring Tim Oberheimer. Thank you very much, Tim, for being on. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, before we jump to today's topics, we would like to invite you to subscribe to this podcast on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. You can always uh, find all these episodes at our Hidden Gen homepage, uh, hiddengen.net. And if you live in the area and you have not been at Hidden Gen, make sure to go to hiddengen.net and get a free trial pass. All right, Sian, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. Thanks for thanks a lot for taking the time to record this. Uh, uh, we we'll talked to Greg, and he said that you have some interesting stuff to share with us today. Um, I like to start uh, just give a description of what what you do at Hidden Gen and uh, how long you've been there. Okay, um, I've been there the past couple months. Um, I came from uh, D1 Dallas and D1 Allen um, previously, but uh, I've been there for around four months now. Um, but I basically train a, a variety of younger kids from a seven-year-old all the way up to people in their 60s, 70s that so they're just trying to become more athletic and just learn how to move their body. But it's just a wide range of all ranges of athletes I train every single day. Nice. Um, and I'm assuming that you train yourself too, right? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> what is, uh, when you're training, what is really your main goal is uh, because we, we we got a lot of bodybuildings uh, but are you more like on the power lifting side are you more on the strong man what is really your specialty um that's a great question <laughs> uh training for myself correct mm -hmm. um i definitely train myself to be a little bit more athletic um i have a collegiate um, experience as being a college baseball player um before i do tend to like to train my body in a way that makes me feel I would say strong, fast, quick, that um, I recently had an ACL and a meniscus tear, um, so I'm recovering from that currently, but um, I actually go back to surgery in about two weeks just to scope out and clean out for my knees so I can feel a little more comfortable, but um, I train typically a little bit more of a, I don't know if you're familiar with like an undulated type of uh, periodization model, so it's much more of a, kind of like a hybrid powerlifting, but I also kind of go into my dynamic effort days as using more of a, like a speed agility work I've been really liking that type of like four sets of six on my max effort days, like Monday, Tuesdays, and like a Thursday, Friday. So it's it would say like more like a, a hybrid power lifter, also at the same time, kind of a little bit more like unilateral training to figure out it's going to help me become a little better at my big three lifts. So it's been pretty fun to kind of mess with. What is the name again that you said of this type of uh, training? Uh, it'd be called uh, undulated oh, periodization. Okay. Can you explain more what is what, what it is about? Uh, yeah, so um, I would say in terms of like any programming, um, it's just how you value your intensity, which would be your weight or your volume, which would be your reps. Um, a lot of it's just, I would essentially just increase my mm -hmm. workload or the amount of work that I'm going to be producing for that one week. I may go into like a 6% maximal workload for that one week. And the next week I may jump up to like a 70 for the next week. And then I may deload based on maybe how my body's feeling. If I'm feeling like, mm, I'm not feeling too great on these couple of lifts, I might as well just deload and go back down. And I can go back into a peak in, say, four to five weeks. So it's a little bit more listening to my body than it is prescribing to my Interesting. body. Interesting. And you do uh, six, one, uh, one day off or two, two days off? Um, I actually pretty much lift four days a week. Um, I do. A, it's very similar to like a conjugate style method. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with more of a conjugate periodization, like a Matt Wenning type of uh, lifting. So a lot more powerlifting aspect. Um, but it's a four day lifting um, that I do for myself. I do like a max effort Monday where for like the first week of six, I'll do like a four by six, five by five, kind of just go across until I hit a peak. Um, and I'll do like a max effort on Monday, Tuesday, if that's a lower body on, on Monday and then an upper body on Tuesday. I do an active recovery rest. So I would technically say it's a five day a week workout, but a lot of it's just getting my cardio in on those off days, non uh, resistance training days and I lift that dynamic effort day, which would be Thursday, Friday. So it's kind of my own fun way of just trying to find a way to move more comfortably and more freely instead of having to worry about a GPP, which is a typical and like your conjugate type of style training that you see a lot in that gym, which is like your chains, deadlift. And like, I would typically use that as like, I'll do a split squat instead of that day to just make it a little bit more dynamic to me. Uh, so I usually train four days a week. I do heavy loads on Monday, Tuesday, 
kind of like a rest cardio Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is more of like have some fun, figure out where I'm most weak at and how it can make me stronger on my Monday, Tuesday lifts. Nice. Uh, but have you done this type of training to a client uh, or, or is this is more for you? Um, quite a bit, actually. Um, more so recently than I have in the past previous years I've, I've done training. Um, this is fairly new that I've been trying out. It's been pretty fun. I have a couple clients that have done really, really well off this method. A lot of ex-athletes who used to be collegiate athletes and kind of want to get back in the gym and lose some body fat just enjoy being strong again and kind of moving the way they want to feel again. So it's been it's been pretty and fun. What is the advantage, in your opinion, about this training? I think a lot of it is honestly just having fun. I think I think so many times I've just talked to people when they go inside of the gym, it's like, I got to be here. I got to lift this weight. I got to do this program, which I totally get. But if, if you find a lift that you like, train it, figure out how to do better at it, and then find a way to have fun doing it. Like if you're like, I love doing a back squat. Okay, well, find a way to figure out what makes you better at back squats. So for example, one of my clients happens to love front squats. So he used to do Olympic lifting. So I was like, you know what, let's find a way to make it a little bit more dynamic. So I may add like a, just to help increase more T-spine loading. So mm -hmm. that was pretty fun to do on a dy dynamic effort day, like a, on a Thursday or Friday. Um, but I think a lot of it's just having more fun and realizing that fitness should be fun. It shouldn't be, unless you're trained for an actual competition that's completely different, right? But if you're just a, an adult trying to get more fit, I mean, find a way to be happy and find a way to be dynamic in the way you move. Because at the end of the day, what is really your goal? I mean, what, what is the reason why you exercise? Well, Are yeah, but I'm, I'm talking about when I said the advantage, not only for the yeah. fact that uh, being fun, but if you think about a lot of people, sometimes they drop gym membership many times just because they don't see progress. So from the scientific standpoint or from the progress standpoint why is this training you believe is a, is a good approach um actually it's a pretty i feel like a pretty easy answer i think a lot of it is finding a way to know where your body is at that day because like I, I think i said earlier was mostly as if if you're going in with a program that day a lot of what you're looking for is well i have to do this dynamic effort this day on that thursday or i have to hit my max lift on those days and I think it's a way to find out with your body, like, okay, well, maybe I'm feeling one out of 10, let's say like three out of 10 that day. At least with that three out of 10, we can just decrease the intensity and decrease the volume and still go through the motions. So that way, by the time you hit the next week, you're still able to feel more fresh. When I, I suppose like a conjugate style method, it's so hard to recover off of that type of met, uh, methodology and that will usually lose people because they just get too tired and they're just too sore. Um, I find that to be a little more helpful. Interesting. Because you as a trainer, you probably have to also identify if it is really the body saying no or is the the person mentality saying no, right? Because if the person is like, well, I'm not really feeling well, are you not feeling well because you're really not feeling well from the uh, recovery perspective of your muscle or is your mind not feeling well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah. um, when it comes to squat, because you mentioned squat, uh, it looks like a lot of your clients are reaching a really good PR, uh, and 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 it's really exciting to watch. Uh, so, what what is really the what is causing them to improve so much on this squat? There is any technique specifically? What are you doing that uh, we've seen this trend at the gym? Um, I think a lot of it was going back to the basics for a lot of my clients, to be honest. Um, it came down to just filming them to make sure their bar path is actually going on a solid line. I think a lot of that's trying to figure out how well is your bar speed. I know I was just sharing a couple stuff with Greg the other day with, a, it's my little Move Factor X, it's, a, it's called an accelerometer. You attach it around your bar and it actually detects your bar speed. So finding out to figure out what is your peak power of that load. So if, if you can figure out what the real potential of that lift is based on a 6% of that load that day, I might be able to figure out better based on your bar speed if I can actually increase you to a certain amount that you can actually handle instead of just guessing. So I can actually be a little bit more methodical about how I can actually prescribe loading instead of just saying, oh, well, you're feeling pretty 70% today. Let's see how that goes. <laughs> but instead, let's focus on the bar path and let's focus about how well we can move weight efficiently. So how do you establish a baseline with this uh, equipment? Um, I basically just use um, their 50% of their one rep max after it's been tested. 
and then I go 50% of the one rep max, and I'll go straight for a bar speed for 10 sets of five. That's what the, the guy at the Rex prescribed for me to do. And then I just use the same thing they use on the graph to figure out what should they be lifting for that amount of for intensity. And it's actually just on the graphs are pretty cool. It uh, takes a lot of the thinking out of my equation. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. I'm, I'm wondering, for example, let's say you have a, a client that gets there, you put the equipment at the bar, and then you ask him to do a, a one rep, and then you measure that one rep, and then you you kind of understand what the what the client is at that point, or you ask, or there are multiple reps to kind of get that initial feeling. Yep, um, the second one exactly. So uh, we would typically do like five reps of fifty percent of their one rep max, um, and for that first lift, I'll figure out okay. The bar speed looks a little higher than it was the other day, so let's push it a little bit more than we normally would. And because I, I personally felt like a lot of the times when I lift, if I go too heavy, I'm feeling very draggy the next week, and I feel like all of my progress I'm trying to go for in my entire program is almost just depleted because either my nutrition wasn't right or my general preparation was not correct. So I think just being a little bit more conscious of your big lift is a little bit more, I guess, more taxing than everything else, obviously. So. Of course, to also achieve those PRs, you also need to focus on recovery. So what do you do anything special for recovery or do you prescribe them to do anything special for recovery? Um, I do actually. Um, typically, which is nice, I have Liz there. <laughs> so Liz has been super helpful when it comes to my clients because you, you definitely know this, using a lot of people you work with is incredibly helpful. Yeah. Um, so having someone like her to help out for some of my clients to just increase a little bit more of their nutrition to prepare for that week is important. Um, and also just for physically for my job, having them just knowing where their body is that day, um, knowing the amount of volume that they get used to that amount of volume, meaning reps, um, it helps them figure out how well they're gonna feel the next week. So I'll I usually add in some type of like foam rolling session. Um, I may add in, on the dynamic effort days, so like that Thursday, Friday that they have on their uh, trainerized app, they'll know, be like, okay, I'm not feeling great today. And they actually have a meter on there that actually shows how well they're feeling that day. So they can actually decrease that intensity based on how they feel, which will just create more blood in the muscle and you'll feel a better recovery. So interesting. Uh, so we talk about squat. Let's talk about bench. Any tips on improving bench? Oh, yeah. I love me some bench. <laughs> <laughs> You hit it right in the nail. Um, bench is my favorite, I'm not gonna lie. Um, I came from a baseball background where back when in the day, I would say even when I was getting my degree, it was <laughs> baseball players don't do bench. Uh, oh, really? I was told that forever. Absolutely, it was really weird. <laughs> um, strength coaches didn't exist back in the day. So like we just had country book film farms guys out there saying, all right, we're gonna go ahead and lift some stuff today. Let's go uh, run five miles and let's go uh, do some dumbbell work and honestly <laughs> nowadays we all know now that it's all about increasing force production so i took that <laughs> took that note from my exercise science professor in college and was like dude you're gonna really love bench press being a baseball player and turned out everything got better when i started bench pressing more so if you go to any college nowadays every baseball player is like yes it's, it's bench press day um but in terms of improving sorry in terms of improving bench press um i've definitely realized that the shoulder as long as it's stable it has to move efficiently for that, and obviously bar path. So everything comes down to bar path and the efficiency of that lift. Um, so I actually added, um, are you familiar with like bottoms up uh, presses with like kettlebells? Uh, yeah, but explain to, the, to our listeners. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So if you held a kettlebell upside down and you're simply just gonna put it right at 90 degrees and you just basically push up above your head, um, I tend to use that quite a bit. Um, it helps out just stabilize the shoulder before you start lifting. Um, which would be your sits muscles. So it would be your, uh, su um, sorry, subscapularis, infraspinatus, teres minor, and, um, and uh, yeah, subscapularis, teres minor, sits, and then. So all those beautiful guys work so well together to help you become more stable. So the minute I know that this is stable, the much better I'll be here. So um, I tend to do like a bottoms up press. Um, there's a couple of little fun tricks I use for uh, some mini bands, just doing some varus pulls with some, uh, some mini bands. Those are incredibly helpful for just engaging my shoulders. Um, I do this quite a bit. In terms of just increasing load, um, a lot of it's just good. Uh, it's just towns to just where your bar path is and knowing when you're gonna lift, so like your cue. So control your breathing, make sure you know, stay within, pull your elbows in slightly, and make sure you know exactly where your feet are. Because if you know where your feet are, you're gonna do very, very well on your bench because you wanna be able to push your feet 
vertically and almost actually like vertical horizontal. So you want to be kind of in this bar path, almost the same bar path the bar's going, which is kind of funny. So if you're laying flat on your back, the bar needs to go here, directly in midline towards your head. It's not going to go straight up and down. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do that. So that's why I want to be able to push their feet a little further up and you'll get a little bit more on that lift. Little details make a big difference. Absolutely. And um, as far as protection do you use any protection when you're benching heavily like uh, sh uh, elbow wraps and things like that or you, you don't use that um i i definitely think in terms of sport of powerlifting i highly recommend it for a lot of my powerlifters that do um for general population for people just out there just trying to increase their bench press i definitely recommend wrist straps uh, that is a huge game changer and, for a and, lot of and, and wrist and elbow right yeah absolutely um, finding protection that you know is going to help become more stable during a lift and knowing that your ultimate goal is to increase obviously the bench it, having protection for your elbow and wrist is incredibly important so knowing that something that's going to if you're trying to create more instability during the lift it's probably not a good idea right mm -hmm. so the more stable we can make our lift the much better off we're going to be so 100% agree so you said that you had a surgery recently right Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, how long uh, are you already back to the gym training? Um, I have been. Um, I actually first got my uh, gym, uh, membership at uh, Hidden Gym, <laughs> talking to Greg when I was actually working at D1 before, and he was like, "Hey, why don't you come over here and come work, man?" <laughs> um, but I absolutely love the gym. That's actually funny. So I, I knew a lot of the people who worked out there because it helped me recover a lot from my ACL and uh, meniscus surgery. So. It was just great to see the crowd of people in there. They've been incredibly nice since I've ever been there. Um, and it's, 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 it's a great crowd, but having that surgery was pretty, pretty rough. <laughs> it's not easy whenever you have to see your kids grow up and you can't really walk around or move and having to rely on your wife to be like, hey, I got to be able to go to the bathroom. Yeah, or it's horrible. All those little things and, are tough. And how was the rehab? How long were you out of the gym? And how long did, did it take for you to be able to lift again reasonably heavy um so rehab in general um i went through an entire six months so Whoa, i was really wow that's a lot yeah the a acl surgeries are no joke um that if, if that's why if you see football players and they come back within i think there's the most recent one was obj right he went to the super bowl and tore his acl again because he came back too early he came back i think 10 yeah 10 months came back in and tore it immediately um but they're very hard to come back from. Um, but about six months of PT, it was probably the hardest thing I probably had to do in my life, to be honest. Um, it's not easy. Um, there was some definitely a, a lot of spiraling uh, health, issue, health, mental issues going on with that type of recovery. Um, but it, it's pretty brutal. So whoever's going through an ACL recovery, it just takes a group of people just to say, hey, it's gonna be okay, give it time. Don't rush yourself. I, did, I definitely did not wanna rush myself. So. I had my wife beating down my head. Stop. You don't want to do front squats yet. You don't want to do back squats yet. Take your time. Um, but it, it was pretty brutal recovery. Um, so I'm currently a year and three months out so of my surgery. Uh, it, so it took you six months to completely start lifting heavy again? Absolutely. When you lift heavy for the first time of this, this surgery, did you hesitate to push further or how was that experience <laughs> i was scared for my life <laughs> and there's nothing worse because um if if they haven't heart told you the funny story of how i terrible story how i tore my acl and meniscus oh no um, yeah go ahead and share if if you're a big cowboys fan i don't know <laughs> um so i was training cd lamb um we were filming a commercial for chipotle and uh he was one of the athletes i was trained at the time and uh i was doing a hurdle hop to a lateral step drill so just hurdling over drill quick lateral step, jump, and lateral. So I hit the last hurdle, and uh, we were about the same height. So I'm 6'3", C.D. Lamb's 6'3". So like, hey, let's just get one more shot. We're almost done. Um, and I got to the last hurdle, and my knee just completely snapped. Um, it was pretty brutal. So uh, that was not a fun time. <laughs> wow, really? That, that was the story? Can't believe that, yeah. man. Wow, that's so bizarre. Yeah. Thankfully, it was a great commercial, though. So if, you, if you're watching the Dallas Cowboys football game and you see a Chipotle commercial come on and you see the drills, I, I, I basically came up with the drills for the commercial, and that was pretty fun. So that was a fun part of my career. I got to work with some professional athletes again, so that was pretty fun. Did you 
felt did you feel immediately that it was something bad or you were like ah no that's nothing bad did you oh it, it pops so loud that um it's sad that the the owner at d1 and alan now he got a video of it and the sound is just terrible it's this super loud pop i end up fracturing part of my tibia as well um during the process it was really just weird it, when i talked to my uh, orthopedic he basically just said it was because i was training so much at the time and i worked a lot as well so i was the head strength conditioning coach there as well so I went a lot and I was doing too much to be honest and I should I should have been more on top of my own workload and my own health of sleeping and eating so um oh really so he was, thinks he thinks it was almost like overtraining type of thing yeah. your body was weak yep wow I, I would wow. agree too to be honest I'm right there with him and how look, do you how do you prevent that um honestly no one went to stop <laughs> Uh, I'm sure there's lots of times whenever we all lift and we're like, oh, I could squeeze out one more round, even though I'm just like, all right, I'm kind of getting tired. My CNS kind of feels a little more tired at the time. Like I may finish like a hack squat and I'm like, wow, my body's really, really tired right now. And I try to do some more reps on like a leg extension for my accessory work. And I'm like, wow, I'm way too tired to perform this exercise. Sometimes it's like, okay, we've reached the amount of, we've, we've done enough damage to our body today. I think it's time to be like, all right, this is good. Let's do some little stretch. Let's do some mobility. And I should have been more cautious about my own body of knowing well, but enough. So, enough yeah, but it's so difficult to find yeah. the sweet spot, right? Because mm -hmm. at the same time, you, uh, myself, everyone, as as we we achieve certain level of this sport, that we always think I still have something to push further, right? And you, that there is that no give up mentality. You want to go, you know, more. So be cautious when this truly physical and you have to stop and not mental is really hard. Yeah, it's a uh, especially being athletes. I, I I heard you like to fight too, so that's a uh, pretty cool, by the way. Yeah. Um, it's a uh, <laughs> it's it's hard. If if you've done anything intense in in your life, if you've played sports, it's really hard for your body to say, you know what, maybe that was enough today. Um, but for a lot of us, we're like, no, we will finish this program. We will finish this workout today because we want to feel completed. Um, and a lot of the times, I mean, some of my most recent clients that, that have come on, they're like, man, I'm, I'm beat. I'm just like, okay, well, we have 15 minutes left. Um, let's go ahead and just actually focus on your weaknesses. So a lot of it's like, well, my hip feels weird whenever I do a lift. So I may just add like a mini band, like so as walk. So just lay on the back and just focus on the hip flexor. I can do stuff like that. Stuff that's not as intense, but can actually help them surround and become a little bit more mobile and more stronger. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, uh, there was anything that you could have done to prevent this other than not having push for example you think that your nutrition was on point your supplementation was on point it was everything was fine um i would i would actually say yes um in terms of working out no <laughs> uh i i definitely should have knowing that i was going to have to work for a long day during that photo shoot for so long and that that whole commercial shoot I probably should have taken two days off prior to that and just worked out the next day after that because I was on a Friday. Um, I very well could have done that, but once again, I was like, I want to complete this eight-week uh, little block computerization model that I wrote, and I want to do it because um, in my mind, I will, after gaining so much weight after first being married and actually losing a lot of weight since then, it, it kind of reminded me of like, don't put things off, don't do that. But at the end of the day, now I've learned that even sometimes 30 minutes to increase your daily activity is super important. And also talking to Liz, never ever try to out-train a bad diet. I think that's a huge thing for a lot of people is to please don't try to overdo yourself just because you want to burn more calories because you ate so bad. Yeah. And was that the case uh, as uh, after you got married that you gained some weight? Oh yeah. I mean, you would just say, I mean, if you're, if you're the love of your life, you're, you're going to be like, sure. What do you want to eat today? I'm like, sure. If you're happy. I'm happy. Um, <laughs> it's normal. I, I don't know if people say it a lot, but if, if you, if you love someone, you're like, sure. I want to see you happy. And sometimes food is the key to a man's heart. And we all know that's true. We <laughs> love foods. So. <laughs> and how was the road to lose weight? Uh, did you lose fast? Um, uh, honestly, it was. Yeah, um, it was actually a little bit faster whenever I actually just started measuring my food. Um, when I f actually just started working at Hidden Gym, like my first week, I told myself, I was like, you know what? This is, seems like a pretty big gym that trains for aesthetics everywhere. There's a lot of bodybuilders. There's a lot of people who are just absolutely just shredded in there, which 
it's pretty awesome to see. It's good to see people who actually care about their health as much as they do there. Um, for training athletes for so long, like I didn't need to have like a eight to nine percent body fat to be honest. Or strength conditioning coaches were meant to increase force production and make people faster. So that's not our ultimate goal as strength conditioning coaches. So now actually realizing that I should probably focus more on myself than stop worrying so much about my athletes. That was a time I was like, okay, I should probably measure my food. And the minute I started measuring my food, I'm like, wow, I am overeating so much food and it's crazy. The minute I realize I need to increase way more fiber in my food, so adding more vegetables, I know everyone says vegetables are gross get over it eat more vegetables they're good for you uh brock is your best friend yeah no i think uh, now you brought up a very important point and mainly now that we are on the holiday season people are eating more and most of the people we know how it goes uh they eat a lot this time already thinking about new year's resolution starting january and start to lose everything right so what are some of the tips that you can share about uh, New, Year, New Year's resolution and uh, how to stay on track? I love this question. In fact, I was really excited that you're gonna ask this question <laughs> um, because it's one of the few things I feel like a lot of people when they get to holidays that they feel super disappointed in themselves because they're like, man, I overate. I feel like I'm way off on my track of my calories. I feel like I'm just, now I feel super bloated. Um, it actually came from the guys who worked out there. Um, one of the guys uh, I work out quite a bit with him there is Zach. He's one that he just got his DPT. So if he's listening, congratulations to you, dude. Um, but he had a good point too. He was like, "Don't be afraid to overindulge in your food during that one day." Um, and I made a good point about it too: is that you've essentially spent however long you've put yourself in a surplus of calories. Like let's just say that you've been overweight for 15 years. So you think by going in by having one bad meal after having such a good caloric deficit for let's say six months, that's gonna throw you completely off. That's one of the worst mentalities you can put yourself in. Don't feel, don't feel bad about eating your food because, but just know your portion sizes, know when to eat. Um, and on top of that, you don't have to eat so much food. And let's just say that you did. Let's just say that you ate a bunch. Then know that one day's not gonna hurt you, okay? As long as you're in a caloric deficit, you know exactly how much calories you need. And if you are overindulging your calories, you could just take a walk. I mean, anything that's super low intense, go play some games with your brothers or sisters, niece, nephews, kids you have. Go play a game. I mean, just increase your activity level that day. I mean, offset it a little bit mm -hmm. um, in the correct way. Don't just go crazy and go do some deadlifts, which you could. Yeah. Um, but um, at the end of the day, you're not gonna do yourself body, your body that much damage by having one day when you've already destroyed your body for 15 years or 10 years that you did. One day is not gonna set you back as what you may think it does. But what you should do is say that was a great time, now let's go back to where we were because we need to go right back to the preparation, dive right back in the battle and just remember that it's like investments, you just do a little bit at a time and it'll end up paying off over time. That's a great tip, great tip and, and a great approach. I think that one of the challenges uh, that a lot of people have is they eat a lot uh, during, for example, Christmas, uh, and then they eat the rest of the food from the previous night on the next day, and then they, they go bad the rest of the week because it's New Year's Eve already there. So one day becomes like one week. <laughs> yeah. And, and that really de derails everything. So you just got to be conscious about that. Yeah. It's just prepping your food. Um, and if you have a chance and you have, I don't know, some animals around, if you have some pigs, there you go. You got some food for your pigs. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, just no, kidding. That, uh, uh, that's a great tip. For great tip for sure. And, and I think that you also brought a, a very important point, which is, and, and you noticed that recently, is track what you eat. Because when you don't track, you think that you are eating normal. But then when you start to actually add on an app, and there are a bunch of uh, free apps uh, that you can use. But once you start to counting those uh, meals on your app, at the end of the day, we'll be like, oh my God, I had no idea that I eat that much calorie. <laughs> yeah, with, with, with most of my clients, I actually, I, I tell them the first time that you have this, and it's so great that we have that trainerized app that we have here, is that we can actually see what you're putting in your body. If we, we, it links up with my fitness pal. So we know just like, just eat your normal food for that week. I want you just to simply learn how to measure. So a lot of it's just saying, here's your food scale. Here's before Liz obviously gives you the nutrition. We want to see how you eat normally. So it's kind of your realization of like, let's measure your food. Let's teach you how to measure because 
breaking one habit's already hard enough. So going to the gym is already a hard habit to get into, right? So why would we want to make you do two habits if you can't do one habit? So realistically, we'll go into one habit. Let's see how you track. And then once you track, you're like, wow, I've been overeating for a while. <laughs> it's a great realization for a yeah. lot of people to be like, yeah. oh, wow, I actually am about like 500 calories over. And if you stay 500 calories over, what happens over a year? You gain probably about what, like 10, 15 pounds. I mean, it's not a lot, but it ends up over and over time. And right? you are be, you are being very nice because most people are not 500 more. Most people are like yeah. 1,000 more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, Tim. Great conversation. I appreciate a lot of your time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good luck on the the next procedure. Um, I hope that the rehab is e easier uh, this time around, and you can be back in training uh, with no time. So thank you very much uh, for recording this today. Absolutely, I appreciate. It. All right, everyone. This is a wrap for today's episode. Thank you very much for your time. Make sure to subscribe. Stay tuned. We have much more to come next year.